Hey everybody, John Ray with Musing Wizard, and today we're going to talk about why start a YouTube channel called Musing Wizard, why create all of this content on Twitter, even if nobody's going, going to listen to it. We're going to dive into some of the motivations b between why you might want to share your story and, and why it's valuable to share our wins. One of the things that has become wildly and abundantly clear to me is that when I talk about the things that I'm passionate about, when I share my wins, when I connect with like-minded and like-hearted people, I, I just open up in a, in a way that I can't if I'm being insular and if I'm keeping those ideas to myself. And, and so we'll unpack not just Musing Wizard today, but why you might want to share your own story publicly and some of the fears that could come up when you do that. But if you can move through those fears on the other side of the fear of sharing who you are authentically are all kinds of juicy rewards. So of course, I'm joined here with Carl Brockman, who's going to guide us through this conversation and, and contribute some meaningful nuggets. So Carl, take it away. Where should we take it from here? Oh, it's good to be here, John. And thanks for having me again this morning. I love how Americans say my name. You know, I, I, to digress and to get completely off topic right at the start, uh, <laughs> I, I say my name and people say Kyle uh, it, it, in, in where I live, it, even in Australia. And I love, I, I love how you guys just, you really pronounce that R. It's, it's Carl. Like it's, it's <laughs> definitely Carl. That, that's just the but, Texan coming in me. That, 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 that's how you say, that's how you say Carl, Carl in, in cowboy land. And, yeah, and, right. and since we're off topic, I'm looking at myself in the, in the Zoom monitor and, and I'm recognizing that the current fashion for, for, for uh, sweaters is, is basically to look like you're in a bathrobe. <laughs> Nowhere does this sweater look more like a bathrobe than on a Zoom call. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, no judgment here, my friend. It looks, it looks beautiful. I, I love I this sweater, and, and I can already feel that it's making me more confident in this conversation, so let's good, get into good. it. And we know that you do need some help with confidence every now and then, <laughs> so yeah, that's good. <laughs> but no, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, I, I obviously, we've been talking for a little bit uh, of time now, John, and look, you're, you're someone that probably doesn't need to have a musing wizard account probably doesn't need to start a youtube channel probably doesn't need to uh spend a lot of time uh making content you know you you have your your real life which we might call john ray and that has its own public standing and and facing uh platforms and uh, obviously you you share a lot about your expertise and interests and whatnot through just who you are but musing wizard this nice little icon on x that beautiful uh, i don't know if you drew it yourself but it's just it's it's definitely a wizard that's musing from my perspective and i thought it could be really cool just to well, unpack why like how does someone who already has all of his time sorry i, I couldn't did you draw it oh <laughs> let's go i have i have a whole journal of wizards i've drawn <laughs> All right, let's let's just go this whole hour. Just look at one at a time, and let's talk about how beautiful. <laughs> well, yeah. How did where did the inspiration for using wizard come from? How does it function? What what? How did how did this even become something that you knew or you, that you felt inspired to spend time on? Yeah, well, I've always known that when I talk about things that I'm passionate about, it literally opens portals in reality that open up opportunity for me, and so. You know, one of the things that's happened over the last few years is, is that I used to talk, talk quite a bit about metaphysics and spirituality on my John Rabe uh, Twitter account and, and YouTube account. But what happened is that I got really deep in, into crypto and, and running crypto businesses and basically becoming a crypto entrepreneur. And the algorithms on those accounts pigeonholed me into a strictly crypto audience. So anytime I share something about crypto, it goes viral. And anytime I share something, anything other than crypto, it's total crickets because the algorithm doesn't know what to do with it. And, and so I was somewhat dissatisfied in no longer being able to have a venue to talk about the weird metaphysical things that I'm in. And, and I recognized how lifting and energizing it was for me to be able to have a venue to talk about that. So I try to weave it into as much of the crypto talk as, it, as I can, but ultimately I surrendered to the algorithm gods and I said, fine, I'll create double the content. And, and, and so I started the Musing Wizard account really with this idea that I wanted to brand myself more as an artist, more, more, more as a thinker, 
Um, you, you, you know, I'm seen to some extent as, as a thought leader in, in the crypto space and certainly as an entrepreneur, but I really wanted an opportunity to just explore with as wacky an idea as I wanted to go with and, and find language around what is it that I actually believe. You know, I, I used to have a blog and blog a lot about metaphysical topics. And, and as I was kind of getting my sea legs in spirituality, I used my blog as a way to find the language for what am I experimenting with? What's working? Why do I feel certain ways about certain philosophies and, and topics? And, and as I kind of solidified more and more, you know, what I felt the nature of reality was and, and the game that I was playing with reality, I really... Um, stopped, you know, finding new language for things. And, and I recognized that that was such a disservice to myself be, be, because there's so much um, understanding that comes from finding new ways to describe things and, and ways to simplify complex subjects. And, and so really Musing Wizard was, was a way for me to de-stress from, from my, my, you know, fast-paced crypto venture capital life. And, and and I used it as a way to just kind of unwind with, with some metaphysical riffing. You know, I've been sober for seven years. I'm not doing mushrooms anymore. I'm not smoking pot. I'm not, I'm not drinking. And, and so I don't end up in, in a lot of the wonky, wacky places where you're sitting in a tree with, with a homeless guy and, and, and talking about the universe. Like, like sometimes the value of just completely letting go control through substances is is that you allow yourself to just really be in the flows of things and people get addicted to those experiences because you really do end up in magical places but what i wanted to showcase is that you can end up in that magical place without the releasing abandon that comes with substance abuse you can get to those same metaphysical places have those same conversations and feel even more invigorated sans hangover if, if you learn how to passionately express who you are authentically, how to find the language of, of what you, you are, why you're engaging in things. And I think that oftentimes substances give us an excuse to say what we really mean. And this channel and, and all my public expression on all my channels is really a challenge to myself. Can you really be who you are? That person that you are when, you, when, when, when you're alone with your closest friends, can you be that with everyone? And it's incredibly difficult to do that because we compartmentalize ourselves and kind of create these personas. Oh, when I go to the Chamber of Commerce, I'm this person. When I'm at the bar, I'm this person. When I'm surfing, I'm this person. When I'm at the gym, I'm this person. I wanted to collapse the walls of all of those personas and do my best to be me in all scenarios. And so Musing Wizard is, is just a way to flex that muscle a little bit and to be in conversation with people I care about, about topics that I care about. Yeah. Wow. So, so much gold just in that unpacking and yeah, that, that compartmentalizing your identity, you know, I, I, uh, as a, what some might call a high performer in my early twenties, working up the corporate ladder, I used to commonly say that that was a work Carl and a real Carl, right? And just, I remember how much energy was expended just to maintain those two identities and being able to, I guess, escape for lack of a better term, that, that, uh, that hamster wheel of chasing carrots I, I came to the realization in, in a long roundabout way that, well, yeah, who, who is Carl at the bottom of it all? What opinions does he have? What does he actually care about? And, and these things obviously take a lot of time to work through. One thing that I love uh, that you pointed out, and I felt like you were just talking straight to my soul. You know, I have been in cycles in my life where I was the guy at 5.30 in the morning and the sun's coming up and I'm talking to some homeless bloke on a bench that I, that I just met half an hour ago and we are having the most amazing conversation about life. Uh, and that I, you, you were right. I was addicted to those experiences, to those conversations, to those opportunities to connect with someone at just such a deep, beautiful level. And yeah, the trade-off of that, well, uh, other than the, the habit of escaping through whatever thing that you abuse was, was the, the hangover, the, I guess the detachment or the, the fractured mentality for the days or sometimes longer uh, after just that an hour experience. And 
And as I've started to work for myself, I've, I've also been had to battle with, well, okay, this is what I have in a box of is okay in, in corporate or okay for business or okay for professionals. Whereas uh, I always rock up best when I am just my best. And, and uh, it, it, that's been really cool to slowly just feel okay. You know, I, I, you mentioned the chamber of commerce earlier. I'm on the committee at one of the chambers here uh, on the sunshine coast in Australia. And, and it's been such a rewarding experience. And again, when, when I started uh, being able to contribute to that, I was wearing the button ups. I was wearing the slacks. I was wearing the RM's boots and I love wearing that stuff, but not all the time. You know, And to be able to rock up to an event and host it in Burks now, and like, I don't know if other people look at me a certain way, but I definitely feel very comfortable. And, and, and so I, I know I, I kind of went down a path there, but, but just that expression of self to passionately express who you are. You mentioned that it just opens up portals Tell me a little bit more about that. What portals has expressing yourself opened up for you, John? Yeah, well, the thing is that when you're clear in your energy, when, when you're clear in your vision, and so when you're talking passionately about something, that that that's you being clear in your vision. And, and, and so oftentimes that clarity comes when you're reducing resistance. And, and it's why sometimes you find it at the tail end of, of a drug binge. You, you, you know, anybody who's ever, you may not have experimented with drugs, but anybody who's ever read a Hunter S. Thompson book un, 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 understands that, that like there is a kind of mental acuity that, that can come from the right cocktail of substances. The problem is that more and more you're only able to get there through substances because you've never practiced getting there in any other way and and so in many ways drugs can be a training wheels into finding the feeling of what that flow feels like but eventually if you want to continue to evolve and if you want to consistently be in that place in a way that doesn't completely overtax your nervous system which is what drugs will eventually do it's why you know the lead singer of pink floyd went crazy like you 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 just can't overclock in that direction as much as you will ultimately want to and so the only opportunity to maintain that state in all areas of your life is to learn how to create it without substances. And, and, and you do that by really getting in tune with your nervous system. And, and so why is that important for opening these portals? Well, we live in an energy construct that that is a, a simulated reality experience. Maybe it's a consciousness experience. Maybe we live in a computer. We don't really know, but we know that all people on the leading edge of science tell us that we're in some kind of a simulation and that basically everything boils down to ones and zeros. It's not atoms that, the, that are the smallest things. It's not molecules. It is literally data, information, energy that, that makes up reality. And so when we learn to control and structure the energy of our own systems, we create a rendering of the information around us that that unlocks in an interesting way. Now, are we newly creating a reality where that opportunity exists or did that opportunity always exist, but we just weren't tuned to it? It's a chicken or egg question. And, and a lot of people, you, you know, who want to give it a, a kind of practicality will, will say, well, before you buy a blue car, you never see blue cars on the road. But the second that you buy a blue car, you will literally see every blue car. And I'm I'm uh, blanking on the on the name of that feature, but but there's a functionality in your brain that is just it, it notices patterns. And, system. Yes, thank you. Um, say it again because I could be because I didn't quite hear it. Sorry, reticular activating system. Yes, your reticular activating system is basically your ability to kind of pattern the data of reality because you're only seeing a small percentage of things. And, and so the decision space that's available to you in any moment, you think that you could choose literally anything that you want to, but really there's maybe 10 choices that, that you actually have access to and probably only two that you could realistically choose in that moment. And one is really the likely thing that you're going to choose. So did you really choose it at all. And so when I talk about portals, I'm talking about 
your ability to expand your energy and your consciousness in such a way that that decision space opens up. And instead of 10 decisions, there's a hundred. And instead of your likelihood being to choosing the one that you always chose, maybe you choose this really interesting one that, that wouldn't have been available to you had you not expanded in the way that you did. So what happens when you're taking drugs and, and, and you, you're in that kind of heightened ascension space that comes especially from psychedelics? Well, what you're doing is, you, is you're choosing something that you normally wouldn't choose because you've reduced all resistance towards the fear that you might have towards choosing something that's more anomalous, something that's more off the beaten path. And so what does that do? It takes you on these really interesting experiences because you're choosing something different from what you normally choose. And in the expansion of your energy and consciousness, by, by getting into your body, by feeling your feelings, you will find that you're more capable of seeing decisions that you didn't even know you could make. And, and more importantly, it will feel more inspired to choose those new things. And life is just a series of choices. And so if you start choosing new things, your whole life is going to change. I mean, you could argue that you're two or three choices away from a completely different life, but we always choose the same things over and over and over again. So we live the same life over and over and over again. And it's one of the reasons that I really try to challenge myself to drive to the store a different way, to, to go and explore parts of my neighborhood that I've never gone in, to walk the railroad tracks, you, you know, to do all of the things that you're like, well, normally I wouldn't choose this because I normally I would just choose the most efficient route. No, choose the adventurous route and you will begin to expand all of the possibilities. And when you make new choices, new outcomes are available to you. And that's what I mean by portaling into opportunity. You're choosing something that you wouldn't have normally chosen, but in that moment, it feels inspired. And by being able to choose it, you open up a whole new world that you can now explore. Yeah, I love thinking about the expansion of awareness or consciousness is almost like a marker. And and, and that for me is quite observable, you know? And, and one of the reasons why a, a, an alternate me in another universe loved that 5 30 a.m uh, experience is because my awareness was was expanded like that's literally what one would get from those experiences is that expansion of consciousness awareness and the infinite possibilities that come with that and yeah i've i learned somewhere that we we uh take in two million bits of information per second through all of our senses and so how much of that is important well yeah the reticular activating system decides and obviously decides based on your patterns of of being uh physiology uh your intellect all of those fun things and uh, yeah as you as you sit with yourself you you can observe that expansion of con uh consciousness that expansion of awareness and the abundance of the billions of doors that you can walk through you know that we are all walking past the same opportunities every single day but some of us are able to see some and some of us aren't and i think it was tony robbins who said we are what we focus on and mm -hmm. i think that's just a beautiful uh i guess a beautiful way to make something quite complex very simple and to internalize uh internalize how important it is that well at least one considers what one might be focusing on uh, so no, thank you for sharing that. So tell me, tell me how, how Musing Wizard has been for you in terms of a, almost a science experiment, one that you can, you can be your metaphysical, somatic, that beautiful spiritual woo-woo John Ray. How, how, how have you found the experience so far? Yeah. I mean, really the most interesting part of it is that I find myself being more like I am in Musing Wizard in my everyday life. Like, like I talk about somatics all the time in my crypto conversations now, where before I started Musing Wizard, I never did. Like I just wasn't in that place where I was talking about it, where I felt comfortable talking about it in front of that audience. Now it's like all I talk about. Like, like, like sometimes I wonder why do I even have two channels? Be, be, because it's so weird how the people in crypto that were ready for that messaging just kind of found me and joined my community. And, and now that's what we talk about in, in Twitter spaces all the time. Like, like today, when I was in a Twitter space, I had to double check like, wait, which Twitter account am I in right now? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and and so in, in many ways, like it has, it gave me a permission slip to be me 
in the other accounts. And, and, and it, it, it just opened up those channels in a way where I, I had more access to that creative flow. And then that just naturally flows through me wherever I'm at, because I'm attempting to be as open as I can with everyone around me. Now, of course, I, I wait and root everything towards a crypto audience and, and on my crypto accounts. And, and I really go into to the metaphysical woo woo you know, somatics of it on the Musing Wizard account, because that's what I'm trying to build those audiences for. But the most impactful thing that I've noticed is that the more that I focused on finding language around the, the spiritual things that I was into on Musing Wizard, the more that people in my crypto community that resonated with those concepts that I wasn't even talking about on my crypto channels started to find me. Because what was I was doing? I was amplifying my vibration around those things. And that's one of the, the things I I mean when when I'm talking about a portal opens up, I, I there they I I could have never just started writing the, those posts on my crypto account and and found those people be, because I wouldn't have been able to find the flow that I was able to find by just creating a new account and then I didn't even have to post anything on my, on my crypto accounts because those people naturally found my vibe and your vibe attracts your tribe. And, and so it's just so hilarious that my crypto tribe is becoming my spiritual tribe. And, and in many ways, my spiritual cri tribe is, is becoming my crypto tribe because people hear me mention crypto on, on the Musing Wizard account and then they end up DMing me about crypto. And I'm like, did I just Freaky Friday these accounts? This is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love how you use the term almost like a permission slip to explore the other parts of myself you know I, I you see it with artists they find like well not all of them but some of them find themselves in this box trying to continue to pander to what they think their audience expects of themselves and they lose themselves in the process they lose their ability to create beautiful art because it's not not for them anymore it's for this perspective of what an audience thinks that isn't even real and and yeah that permission slip gave you an opportunity to to map out uh, in a very tangible and uh and manifest a part of yourself that perhaps you were holding back on before and the other thing that i i heard through that was almost integration of a part of self you know it was 100 percent. it was yeah yeah. It, so, so the most important thing for attracting what you want is finding alignment with your vision. So I wanted a more esoteric, spiritually minded community, but I didn't know how to find it in crypto and, 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 and I didn't feel comfortable saying it out loud, but I knew that I wanted that community. So I did whatever the thing that felt aligned for me was. So I created a second account. I started talking about it in whatever way I wanted. I didn't have an audience, so I could literally say whatever I wanted. It didn't matter. And, and, and then what happened is that over time, I just got up to speed with what I was talking about. I got into that vibration and that vibration bled over into all the other areas of my life. My friends and I started talking about it more. My girlfriend and I started talking about it more. My parents and I started talking about spiritual stuff more because I was just in the vibe of that. Like I had found alignment with it where before I wasn't able to find alignment. And, and, and so... I think really the learning was, well, I could have done it on on my my personal crypto account and and like taken a stand and be like, I'm going to overcome <laughs> this fear and I'm going to tell all these crypto people ab about Alistair Crowley and AJ Miller and and, and, and if they don't how they, like it and they they're can... divine beings. And, and that really would have been a disservice to the community that I had built there because they started following me for crypto news, not because of, of my spiritual tendencies. However, the interesting thing that happened is that the more that I got up to speed with, with what I wanted to say, because I didn't really know what I wanted to say, so I used this other channel to figure it out. And the more I was like, oh, that's what I want to say, clearly. Now I was up to speed with that message and there was a natural opening in my crypto communities to talk about those things. What I appreciate about uh, most of the insights that you you have given me and shared on this, on this podcast, no, is, is I guess the th first principle nature of thinking, you know, and it makes sense that if it is an understanding at, at such a deep level, it maps onto all aspects of life, you know, like crypto uh, in itself from my ignorant understanding is a quite a spiritual uh, 
place and technology and it's it's so interesting and again my understanding is quite limited so but it makes sense that this stuff maps beautifully onto that but yeah that giving yourself the permission and the avenue and the the function or the platform to just just messy action just throw shit at a wall and figure out what you actually mean and want to say and what interests you and then find that map i think is such a beautiful right well, it goes back to something that I've talked a lot about on this channel. I can't remember if you and I have specifically spoken about it, but it, but it's following the breadcrumb path. So Abraham Hicks always talks about this breadcrumb path. And what is the breadcrumb path? It's what feels interesting right now. So do, if it's something scary might be interesting to you if you're somebody who likes to overcome your fear. So if you're somebody who likes to set a challenge, I'm going to overcome this fear. That might be the most interesting thing for you. But if you're somebody that hasn't quite built out that nervous system uh, of wanting to take fear head on, maybe the, the path of least resistance and the breadcrumb path for you is to just start journaling about it to yourself, like, like getting into the vibe of it a little bit. It, it, it's why practicing like visions and, and, and writing out the, the vision that you have for things can be useful because what you're doing is you're getting yourself into the vibration of that. And the more that you're focused on, on something that, that you want, that feels interesting, that feels inspiring, the more that that's going to draw experiences to you. Because remember, this is just data rendering itself and, and and so you're not only going to tune in to the data that maybe you wouldn't have seen before that's relevant to what you start practicing but we could we could definitely make an argument that perhaps reality itself will re-render itself around the things that you're focusing on and and you you know certainly the more that you do this this type of proactive vibrational work the more that you realize oh wow that's so crazy. I didn't even have to have a conversation about that. I literally just practiced the conversation in my journal. And naturally, the outcome that I was hoping that would come from a conversation like that happened without me even having to have the conversation. Now, sometimes that can be spiritual escapism because you should be able to have hard conversations with people. And, and, and part of spiritual integrity is you being able to communicate your truth regardless of what it is, regardless of how you think it's going to be received. But there's a creativity in that. You don't have to be an asshole that's just telling everybody what, what, what things are be, be, because there needs to be that 10% of you that's always like, well, I don't know for sure that I'm right about this. And in that humility, you can start to find the the language, the creative language that allows you to have seemingly hard conversations in, in a playful, fun, uplifting way that, that allows you to connect with that person rather than distance them. Yeah, that is so true. That is so true. I'm thinking about, uh, so through my experience, I've, I've spent a lot of time working with leaders and uh, business owners. And uh, a part of the work that I have done is is help them with said conversations, right? It's 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 the 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 most common opportunity I, I see is, is that build up. It's like they're suffering in their imagination before the reality occurs. Yeah. And that build up, that tense, that either repressing or, or not uh, feeling emotion leads to a conversation where they're tense and not feeling emotion and, 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 and stutter and, and, or they, uh, they get some words back and then they snap, you know, and it's just, it isn't a very productive exercise, but, but at the core of it to remember that like one and whether this, uh, links beautifully to alignment or, uh, some of the, the things here or not, I'm sure it would at some level, but to remember that you care about this person. Mm. I believe it just goes such a long way to making this conversation easier. You are giving this feedback because you care. You yeah. are having this conversation because you care. And and that frame, like again, can can align one to be like, well, yeah. And it, actually it's worse for all of us if I don't yeah. have this conversation. Right. Well, and it's, you know, for anyone who is truly looking to be on a spiritual adventure you know, which once you understand what that is, it's a really sticky idea to, to that, that your life is just this kind of unfolding adventure of, of, of energy playing itself out. And so to become the wizard alchemist, since we're talking about musing wizard, to be that wizard, which is the alchemist, the alchemist is somebody who can transmute the energies of whatever's in front of them into something that is a higher frequency that serves the most amount of people. 
And and so anything in front of you, you contributed to that. That's the first rule of wizardry is you have to accept personal responsibility for literally everything in front of you. If you are perceiving it, it doesn't matter if it's physically in front of you. If you're perceiving it in the news, if you read the newspaper, if you read a blog post, whatever that thing is that you perceived, you contributed to it, contributed to it at some level. Now you have to feel your feelings about your contribution to that. And, and if you can do that, that's how you practice humility and humility is required for magic. And, and when you can operate from a state of, of true magic, true humility, you, you get to exercise your energetic rights as an alchemist rather than a narcissist. That's so true. And it, it is just always received so much more effectively when it comes from a place of humility and care it just no matter if you get the words right no matter if the conversation goes completely sideways based on your plan it's it is that uh, well am i going to this conversation to make sure this person knows i'm right or am i going to this conversation to make the path forward a bit easier for both of us right the the worst way to to uh, be in conversation with a narcissist is to meet them at the level of narcissism. Yeah. That that's just an ego battle that goes well, nowhere. The you, the so. the way that you always negotiate with big personality. I didn't hear what you said, but, that's, but, that's, but that's why I struggle to talk to you, John. <laughs> <laughs> the 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 best. Well, let me tell you how to do it. <laughs> the 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 best way to engage with in negotiations especially with, with someone that has a big personality especially that leans towards nar narcissism is to become incredibly vulnerable and humble in the moment be it, it's why nonviolent communication is an interesting thing to study and practice be it, because in nonviolent communication the the way that you respond to someone who is attacking you it, is you consciously recognize what you're feeling in your body and then you state that into the room I'm I, I'm not sure if this is your intention, but right now I'm feeling really uncomfortable and I'm trying to figure out why. So so you're not saying it's your fault. You be they they can't argue with how you feel. You feel how you feel. You're not projecting it onto them. You're you're just saying I, I want to figure out why I feel this way because I would like to get on the same page as you. And when you can go to that vulnerable state where where you're literally speaking your feelings into the room, not projecting them, speaking what they are into the room, then that's a very effective way to negotiate with a narcissist. Yeah, I really like that. It's it's not combative. It's not well, I'm right and you're wrong for talking this way. It's just exactly your objective view on the situation and, and just yourself in the situation or the situation in general. Right. It maps so beautifully to a skill model that I used to facilitate uh, for handling complaints or uh, objections in a retail store. And uh, it was really quickly just heat. So hear, acknowledge, ask questions, take action. And I, I I love your your lens again. It's just a deeper. It's it's goes from intellect into physiology, which I really like. But the acknowledge part's the powerful part. Like just here, just just let them, just let them, and then it and literally say, okay, so tell me if I'm right about this. This X Y and Z. Acknowledge they're not crazy. Ask a couple of questions. It just completely dissipates all of the emotion because it makes yeah. them now think more consciously through what they're upset right. about. What you're building is a container for them to actually see what they're saying because you're literally saying it back to them. Now, let me make sure I got this right. And then they have to hear what they just said. And in hearing what they just said, they're like, ah. Oh. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, I really like that. Yeah. So, okay. This title, the title of this video can be how to disable every narcissist in your life. I really like that. It's a good, a good little short. <laughs> I've worked with many of them and, and so I'm pretty good at disarming them. And, and, and also narcissists tend to be, uh, scared visionaries. So, so the, the only reason that a narcissist has an edge is because they're really afraid to truly step into their visionary status, but they're so close to it. And oftentimes they, they're living in it. It's why they attract so many people to them. And, it, it, you, you know, they may be living in visionary 51% of the time, but, but the, that other 49%, you, you, you know, slowly starts to erode at them until they're no longer EV positive and they start to disintegrate. In, in, into their own inability to practice humility. So interesting. So, so spot on. I'm just thinking about 
about a couple of uh, individuals in my life. Uh, to, to, to sort of come back to the Musing Wizard, one thing you said at the start of this chat that I really wanted to come back to was why it might be a good idea to share your own story publicly. So yeah, if you, if you will, please just unpack that for me. You've spoken a little bit about why it's been a good idea for you and the Musing Wizard, but, but generally why, why you think it could be a good idea for many of us to do that. Well, your one language is code, right? So, so whatever you're saying out loud is how you're coding re your reality, but also whatever you're saying internally to yourself is how you're coding re reality. And, and so at an, energetic level reality is a feedback loop and and whatever that inner dialogue and external dialogue is ultimately you're amplifying that and creating more of it and and so one of the benefits of saying your story out loud is just like we were talking about creating the container for the angry customer by by stating back to them what their story was that's basically what you're telling them is here's the story i heard you just tell well well you're creating a container where they have to have awareness of their story when you start to tell your own story out loud, especially on a podcast, like early on, I, re I remember many years ago when I started doing podcasts, I would do a podcast and then I would go back and listen to it and I would be like, oh, God damn it. <laughs> Why would I say that? <laughs> like, like it made me so uncomfortable to hear myself talk about myself. And, 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 and it's because I recognize that I was practicing a story that one, maybe I wasn't fully uh, aligned with, um, and, and two, that was an old story that didn't really represent me anymore. And, 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 and so the more that you're telling your own story, the more that you're going to find the channel of inspiration that allows you to move your story forward in every single conversation that you and I have. And, and really anytime you're speaking authentically, what you're going to recognize is, ooh, there's a nugget I haven't said before. There, there's something I hadn't thought about before. That's an interesting way to frame that. And then that becomes a part of your lexicon. And that lexicon is the code that you use to program reality. So when you're actively telling your story, and that can be in the moment, talking about what you're learning, what you're perceiving, how you're thinking about things, and setting the context on your blog or channel that this is an evolution of, of me figuring these things out, what you end up doing is finding the story that is aligned with you. And what happens when you find that that alignment with your own personal story? Well, it's just what we were talking about earlier, where all of a sudden everyone in my crypto community is a spiritual guru now. Like they all <laughs> want to talk about this in spaces. This doesn't make any sense. Well, of course it makes sense because I got in alignment with the story I wanted to tell. And then your vibe attracts your tribe. So if you're looking to change the tribe that you're hanging out with. You know, this happens with, with alcoholics all the time. When you stop drinking, you're gonna end up having to find all new friends be, be, because you weren't connected with them at any level other than the experience of, of drinking. So maybe a handful of those come with you or, or you're able to connect at a deeper level. But for the most part, you have to form a new tribe. It's why going to things like AA can sometimes be interesting because maybe you can find some kind of like-minded or, or like-hearted connection there. But it's also the reason that people go to music festivals and, and, and the reason that, that they go to church. Like group ecstasis is a real thing and there's healing in, in groups that way. And, and, and so basically what I'm trying to say is that in order to find the group of people that you live your life with, these people that ultimately you end up calling your friends, if you start to say who you are out loud, first, you're going to have your own visceral reaction to it because you're going to be able to know, wait, is that what I want my life to be? Is that who I am? As soon as you say it out loud, as soon as you hit the publish button, you will immediately have all of the fears come forward on how you actually feel about that story. Your job or your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to sit with all that fear, that discomfort. I can remember in the early days of blogging about spiritual stuff, I, I would be like, this is such a great blog post. And then I'd hit publish and I'd be like, God damn it, I am so terrified of all the people that are gonna read this. And then I would just have to sit with all of that and let that play out on my system. To the point now, I can literally write whatever pops into my head and feel totally aligned with it be, because I just practice it. And and what why is the alignment important? Because your vibe attracts your your tribe. And and your your tribe is the people you meet at the grocery store, the person that what that washes your car, the person that changes your oil. You're gonna end up having an experience 
with all of those people that is aligned with what your current vibe is. If you're practicing, uh, oh, I'm a victim. I hate my job. Man, my, my mom's always getting on my case. Like if that's your vibe, guess what? Everybody in your life, your entire tribe of people that make up your reality are going to be reflecting that back to you. So how do you change the world? You change yourself. And you do that by feeling through your big feelings, by practicing your story, by getting up to speed with that story, and then watching it ripple out into reality. Yeah. So, so beautifully articulated it. And yeah, to share your story publicly, you know, on a function like X, Instagram, YouTube, whatever, is just one function on, on how to share your story. You know, I love, you mentioned earlier, a great opportunity for people that want to work through fear and might not be someone who's ready to just dive into the unknown is to write about it. And I personally have gotten a lot of value from just writing about feeling, you know, it's still up here, but it's it's a step to the the feeling anyway. And, and it's just, okay, well, yeah, what is this? Why why does this make me feel uncomfortable? And then what I love about writing is that it's now objective and in front of me and I can add to it. I can complete ideas and thoughts or make them more whole anyway. They don't just run around in circles in my head. And then I can compare that objectively to a way worse fear, which is X, Y, and Z. One of my deepest fears is to wake up when I'm 40 and have a family that just that I just can't be... Uh, present for or uh, share abundance with because I'm stuck in a job that just frustrates me. And anyway, that, you know, I'll, I'll, go, I'll keep going down that path. Uh, but yeah, so any any short-term fear just pales in comparison to that fear. And, and that helped me quite a lot over the last few years, especially start my own business. Uh, and again, why I love conversation. Conversation, and we can link ideas together. We can link thoughts together. We can build on top of each other. Uh, it's another another example of, of an opportunity to share your story, and it doesn't have to be in a in a public function, but in in whatever vein. And I guess from my perspective, and hearing you uh, unpack that, is that by by retelling, by sharing, by trying to articulate your story, you can see it as a story. You, it doesn't remain this thing that keeps wrapping around in circles in your head. And you can see the opportunities in the story. You can see what you don't like about the story. You can you can look at it as if someone was telling you their story. You'd be like, oh, dude, you're so lucky you went through that because now you get to overcome that or you get to prove those people wrong or you get to come out the other side stronger and better. And you can, you can acknowledge, I guess, that we've all have trauma and we all have experience that experiences that we need to work through, but acknowledge how we can alchemize those experiences, how that they can become part of our hero's journey, how we can turn base metal into gold, how we can get out of the belly of the beast and, and uh, save our grandpa from the whale. And, and uh, uh, yeah, I really like that. I think when, when I asked the question, I was thinking specifically about the public fl facing platforms and, I have a little bit of PTSD, you know, four years or three years ago, I threw away a very uh, hot, like a, on paper, a really great job at someone in their mid twenties to, to buy 15 grand worth of video and microphones and podcasting equipment and start a podcast really publicly after not being on social media for fucking three years. So I have a little bit of PTSD, a little trauma around that experience and I'm still quite reluctant to to share myself publicly i think one reason and i'd love to get your perspective on this john you've already talked about it a little bit but one reason is that i i still feel like how i'm presented online whatever the platform is i i just don't i'm not married to it and i don't know how to rectify that and I'm married, like I feel so aligned in my function day to day. And it's such a blessing. It's so nice not to have to worry about how I show up anywhere. But just online, I just, I don't know. Am I still pandering to a corporate expectation of what professionalism is? Am I still uh, putting myself in a box and just, I, I can only play a coaching and business development game? Like, I don't know what that is. What advice would you have for someone who, who uh, wants, who needs support or, or is thinking about how they present themselves or their brand or alignment with how they uh, take and publicly facing. I mean, 
I think hiring a coach is basically like doing a podcast without recording, right? Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and so the conversations that you have with your coach or your therapist, like those are you being authentic in that moment. And, and so in many ways you could reframe those as this is me practicing being authentic. You, you know, even in these conversations, like recognizing any conversation that you've had that is energizing, which showcases that you're closer to authenticity than, than in conversations that feel draining or feel like a slog. So, so again, it always comes back to tuning into your own energy levels and, and recognizing what is lifting and what is draining. And, and when you have a conversation that's draining, there was something in that where you weren't being yourself, where you, you weren't being as true to who you actually are. And, and, and so you kind of just have to use that up down kind of energy flow as, as a compass to what is it that I actually want to say? You you know, a, a good practice after any conversation is Abraham Hicks would call it call it segment intending. It is like you're preparing for the next segment of your day. You you just had this conversation. Now you're preparing for something else. But the but before you can kind of visualize the next part of your day, you kind of have to process what just happened in the last part of your day. And and, and so after you have a conversation or an experience, and now there's like a clear chapter marker on that experience. Like now you're leaving work and you're getting in your car. It can be really beneficial to just take. 60 seconds to tune into yourself and feel like, okay, was that last chapter draining of my energy or lifting of my energy? Like I always walk away from these conversations feeling super lifted. I ha I went and had lunch with, with a good friend of mine to today. I walked away just feeling so jacked after that conversation that I was like, yes, this is what I want my life to be. Just all conversations like this. But Sometimes I will have a conversation and I'm like, this is so emotionally exhausting to be in this conversation. And so then you have to unpack what is the series of decisions that got me into this conversation in the first place? Almost always, it's because there was some decision you made that wasn't true to you. It wasn't your highest interest. And and, and so you steered yourself into something that that had you been true to yourself, you wouldn't have chosen. And this just comes from practice of, of learning what's meant for you and what's not meant for you. And, and so when it comes to your podcast, maybe it was the subject matter, maybe it was the type of people that were, that were on there. Well, maybe it was you, that, maybe that, that it, was. it was that you were giving it too much importance or, or placing too much importance on an outcome. You know, one of the reasons that I find this podcast that, that we're doing together to be so uplifting is because I have I don't even care what happens. Like, like, like it probably frustrates you because we haven't even posted one of these episodes yet. And I'm like, no, I don't I care. Know. I just like having the conversation. <laughs> no, I completely agree. I'm just having so much fun. It, it is already the best just by catching up with you a few times a week and yeah it was the latter you know and then this is this was a really important part of my life i needed to be shown the consequences of my naivety and i i underestimated the challenge i put all of my eggs in one basket i wasn't willing to make it about me and put myself out there and people aren't going to follow a logo with a cool different person uh, every week uh they're also not going to follow a logo that doesn't have a clear purpose and mm -hmm. My, my purpose was let's just get to know this really interesting person that I find interesting. Like that was literally the, the whole uh, concept. So uh, I learned a lot and now I am just so grateful for that experience, but that definitely took some time to, to work through. And I, and now that I am starting to uh, feel more centered, have my own opinion, feel very excited about a lot of the things in my life. I want to share that. Uh, but then there's still those layers of, and we in Australia, we struggle with uh, Paul, uh, tall poppy syndrome. I don't know if you've heard of that in the States. So apparently uh, when poppies grow, the tall one will, will get chopped off or, or something along the lines of that. I don't know the exact science, but tall poppy syndrome is, is like the, the crabs in a bucket. Like one crab might try to escape the rest of the crabs, pull it back down. In Australia, we, we struggle with that. We, we, don't lift, we don't put ourselves up on a pedestal often. Uh, we are quick to pull down the person that stands up. Mm. Uh, not kind of like the opposite. I love, uh, I guess, American culture. I feel like sometimes you guys have just this complete undeserved <laughs> arrogance. Uh, which sometimes, sometimes. But you guys, are, you're confident. You're happy to say what you're good at. You're happy to say what you're passionate about. You're happy to say uh, what makes you strong, capable, confident, 
and we we as a culture just we that's not ingrained in us we're like mm. oh yeah we, we got lucky or oh yeah that's nice like thank you but it was really up to this guy you know but yeah that's just kind of like a default um i would i, I, would, I, I just had that. a thought that that tall poppy syndrome so so when you be when you become big like, like it's almost like you become a target but but in the context of poppies if you become too big you get chopped off but then you become heroin <laughs> and so and so you become the the infuser of uh, of experience and, become and so the best feeling on planet earth i don't i haven't done heroin by the way i'm just guessing, <laughs> I'm just guessing. guessing yeah i mean I I, I mean, I've, I haven't done done her heroin either, but uh, what, what I'm thinking about it is, is like the ability to induce such an expansion of consciousness. Like, why wouldn't you want to be the tall puppy? That was a great frame change. That is that is gold, John. That'll go <laughs> absolutely viral in Australia for the ones that want to stand up. That, that is awesome. <laughs> oh but yeah yeah so i guess overcoming that you know I, there's obviously some insecurity there's obviously some other work that i need to i need to get done and i'm very conscious and grateful that i'm not trying to rush there i'm not i don't need a brand i don't need to um publicly share my life for any reason but i would like to more confidently uh express my thoughts feelings uh attitudes interests and and i'll, I'll get better but yeah, I guess I guess there are. I see, and this is probably just my algorithm, right? But on my small adventure of X that hasn't been consistent at all, and that shows in any results that I do or do not get, uh, I see a lot of just uh, young men hustling. We've spoken about this a little bit, and I, I like I just get that sense of the white knuckling, you know. And I was there, and you yeah. were there, and we've all been there, and. I think right. that is the, the most thing important thing is always to have fun. And and that seems like such simple advice. And, and everybody that is in a hustle harder mindset, like is going to roll their eyes at that. But when you can figure out how to have fun doing something, you're going to just keep doing it because it's fun. Like, it's one of the reasons that I was like, okay, I got to connect with Carl be, because the way that I was doing my videos where I was just talking to the camera wasn't fun anymore. It felt like a slog. And and being in conversation with you is so fun. I'm like, we can make as many videos as, as we can be, be because it's just a lifting. It, like, it's so much more lifting than me trying to be like, okay, well, SEO says I should talk about this. So let me try to spin a metaphysical yarn about this one. <laughs> Yeah. oh man yeah these are fun sums you know, it's, it's all right it's, it's, it's see what i mean it's it's in it's in my dna to, to, mm -hmm. to you're to, heroin yeah. carl you Thanks, are heroin God. i am heroin this has been a good really good morning this morning <laughs> oh man oh i need to just start i need to start um yeah having fun with with my my socials absolutely that that is just a frame that for whatever reason i haven't considered consciously and and then here, here's the thought exercise that, that you can have in your journal okay i want to say this what fears turn on how are people going to judge me and and then what you do is you just map okay well why am i what, what is it that i feel about that judgment oh i'm afraid that i'm not going to be able to get clients i'm afraid my existing clients are are, are going to you know, have cross words with me or not want to be associated with me. I'm speaking from personal experience because I've gone through all these fears. Um, you know, I'm afraid that people are going to publicly attack me. Somebody's going to say I'm stupid. Somebody's going to try to ask me for the science of what I'm saying. Like these are all fears that I've had around sharing metaphysical con concepts. So some cynic is going to call me a charlatan and tell me that I'm I'm trying to start a cult. Like these are all very real fears that I've had. And so what do you do once you know that that's your fear? You just sit with it and you and you say, "Okay, well what if that did happen?" And then you play it out in your nervous system to the point where you're like, "Okay, I'm not really afraid of that anymore." And then the next fear comes out and you just sit with it and you let it play itself out in your nervous system as if, "Yeah, okay, so the worst the worst case that's going to happen is all your clients are going to quit." Okay, well, let's feel what that would be. That would be really uncomfortable temporarily. Yeah, it's always temporarily. Yeah. At the start. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and 
the interesting thing is that the more that you feel through that discomfort, that's the energy work that you're doing. Now you're tuning yourself in, in a way that's going to attract the people that on the other side of that, even if it did happen, are going to come in and, and be better clients, like people that you're more interested in working with, people that want to pay more money for the parts of the work that you actually like and don't care about the parts that you don't like. Like that's ultimately how it works. And it's so hilarious how the top consultants, you know, who charge the most money don't do any of the detail work. <laughs> like they're solely in visionary mode. And, and it's because people are so sick and tired of yes men around them, especially in the corporate world. They want somebody who will bring a true contrarian perspective, something that is outside of what the safe thing is. And the best consultants, maybe not all, they, not all of their ideas are going to get implemented, but I guarantee you the people that are receiving those ideas are going to be like, well, we can't do that because I have fear in myself, but man, what a cool idea. And they're going to want to keep hiring you because they're going to hope that at some point they can get up to speed with doing one of the things that you're pitching. And when they do, like, it's a fun experience for everyone because we're doing something different. We're being a little bit dangerous. Like, ultimately, everybody wants to find that edge in their own life. And if you can't find it in your actions, what do you do? You find it in substance abuse. And that could be food. It could be alcohol. It could be drugs. It, it, it can be love addiction. You're addicted to Netflix, your own biochemicals. Drama. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Drama. Sorry. Sorry to cut you off, John. But right. Yeah, drama. Like just I was reflecting on some of the circles that uh, from high school and, and afterwards, you know, just some some of the people that I were was fortunate enough to have association with were just so addicted to them just like stirring the pot and just something happening I, yeah that's really interesting to reflect on all right drama is a, is a chemical it's a, you you literally have a pharmacy inside your body and and when you're engaged in high emotion activities which is what drama is you're you're producing chemicals in your body you're producing dopamine that because you're in that fight or flight mode and you get addicted to your own biochemicals. And that's why you keep seeking out experiences like that. Cause you don't know how to produce those chemicals without engaging in that behavior. But of course you can produce not just those chemicals, but way deeper levels of expanding chemicals using your own personal pharmacy. I'm not talking about imbibing anything. I'm a teetotaler over here. I too am addicted to my own biochemicals, but I've learned how to wield my own pharmacy in a way that gives me expansion and clarity of thought. It's a tree. It's magic. It's alchemy. Uh, we didn't even get to uh, what I wanted to do in this chat, John, is to uh, share with you a couple of things that some wise uh, wizard with a cartoon logo has been sharing on Twitter. So maybe we'll do that next week. I'd love to take you back to a couple of your posts that I'm sure you put so much thoughtful time and energy and, and attention to and copy edited and send it to your manager and made sure that they were good. So I would love to unpack those with you next week if you're interested, John. Yeah, that sounds great. And, and, I I I think it would be interesting for me to go back because so much so many of my tweets are just like stream of consciousness. Like while I'm driving, I think of something and I just throw Don't it lie. into you, a tweet you scheduler. Take time, no, <laughs> yeah, you have four hours every day just to write one tweet. I, I've seen your schedule. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm time blocking all of those out. Yeah, I would love to do that. And and I guess my my closing thoughts on on like why is Musing Wizard important to me? It it really is that it is energizing when it's not energizing the channel will cease to exist because i won't do it anymore and i know that the more energized i i am around ideas like this the more that i'm able to contribute to the ripple effect that we've talked about before when my cup overfloweth then i serve my family better i serve my community better i serve my state country and world better and the universe at large i become an optimal node in the consciousness machine and i 
through my excitement and energized joy of talking about these subjects, raise the consciousness of the entire planet. And so in that way, we're solving poverty, we're solving hunger, we're solving wars, because what we are doing is elevating the frequency in having a fun conversation. It doesn't, we don't have to talk about spiritual good things, just laughing is a way of elevating the frequency of the entire planet so that people just are not as capable of tapping into ideas that would hurt others. And ultimately, that's why comedy and comedians and, and, and filmmaking and art is so powerful. And it is the, the tool that the wizard wields for external alchemy, be, be, because when you can make other people laugh, when you can make them smile, when you, when you can light them up in a way where they're like, I'm going to do that, you are literally changing the frequency of the entire network of nodes in the consciousness network and the future is bright. What a beautiful way to, to end this chat today. I really enjoyed today. And to give you a sneak peek of some of the wisdom that uh, the Musing Wizard has shared over the last year and it links, links so beautifully to that last little monologue is I am in co-creation with the father. There's a lot more to that tweet, which we'll come back to next week, but we are, and that that's definitely my perspective. We are here to create. We are here to create in alignment with the totality of all existence and where you call that God, the universe, whatever you call it. I, I genuinely believe that. And, and we create through the soul, through our intuition, through our spirit. And it's not until we're able to get out of survival mode, to get out of our ego, that we can find alignment and start creating rather than consuming whatever yeah. your vice and addiction is. So, totally. John, and so. and if that if the intro of that tweet, I'm co-creating with the father triggered you because you have daddy issues or or, or because you have <laughs> issues around <laughs> that statement, then I promise you, you're going to love our next chat because I am going to take you down a rabbit hole of what the father means in alchemy, in spirituality, in hermetics, and, and, and in Christian Gnosticism. So strap in. Let us know in the comments what you want to see next. We, we're going to dive deep in, into that tweet and many others. If there are other topics that you want to talk about, let us know. If there are things that you don't know what we were talking about, let us know so that we can unpack them further. This community is about us creating that feedback loop just the way that reality does. And, and until then, I'm John Ray with Musing Wizard. Carl, thanks for being here. And we'll see you all in Sorry. the next one.